thank you for lasting for so long. It's been a, a very intense week. I, I saw wonderful, wonderful talks, and I think this is this is this is my favorite summer school because it's kind of a connection between different disciplines. Um, but it is the last talk, and so I'm not going to stress your your. Uh, your 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 intellectual capabilities too much no no um, no formulas no complicated algorithms uh, mostly just pic pictures okay uh, and a lot of hand waving and maybe some philosophy so um, and please don't feel free to interrupt it you know if we don't get through the whole thing it's fine we'll we can continue during the the dinner um, and it's it is all really about the data. Um, although we are told, if you open any any any, you know, uh, popular paper, uh, you know, uh, newspaper or, or magazine, you know, AI is basically here, right? It's it that's that's it. You know, you uh, deep learning solves everything. Uh, kids nowadays in in high school they don't program their you know their first programming language is not Pascal or Basic or anything. It's TensorFlow, right? And because for every any given problem, you just you know label some training data, define objective function, train neural network, and sell your startup for for millions, which is basically what happens all the time in on in in the Silicon Valley. Um, and and indeed, we have some you know exciting uh, uh, I I results after you know proverbial wandering in the in the wilderness for for uh, for thirty years, right? We have. Uh, the ImageNet results, we are getting a more than 80% correct on the ImageNet data set of predicting labels from images. Uh, something close to my heart, planetary scale geolocalization. You give computer an image and will tell you where on Earth it was taken. Pretty cool. Um, even automatic image capture. This is just some random examples. Uh, but I, I really like this one because if you look at this, so, you know, you, computer gets an image, spits out a, a, a sentence. Look at this. A group of people posing for a picture on a ski lift. Take, you know, think about this for a little bit. I think, you know, in singularity might be close. This is really, really insightful uh, uh, caption. This is really, uh, imagine all the things that you really need to know, like the idea of posing, to get this one right. This is, this is really, really impressive. So we must be done. It's done, we can close down shop and all become philosophers. Well, not quite. Um, yes, you know, for image classification, performance on ImageNet is more than 80%. But if you take that AlexNet or whatever and you just walk around in any random city, the performance drops to 30%. Right? Why is that? Well, it's because the, world, the real world doesn't look like ImageNet images. This is my favorite uh, uh, class from ImageNet. It's called T-shirt class. And these are real T-shirts. And you shouldn't be blaming the algorithm for not generalizing from that to that, because this is just a completely different beast. It, it's, it's, it's so different, you know, you shouldn't expect this kind of generalization to happen. Um, image captioning, OK, so here is an example of an image I got from the internet. And I piped it for one of those online capturing uh, software and it says a car parked on the side of the road well, yeah it's reasonable maybe like in england or new zealand or something right but 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 you know it's an Aston Martin V8 Vantage. It's obvious. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> obviously yeah but but you know it's it's getting you somewhere but then then i thought wait a minute and i went to a google image search and i just queried for cars you know on google and that caption basically would fit pretty much almost all of them, except maybe for this one. It would fit basically every other image, right? And indeed, if you take something slightly unusual, yep, it's a car parked by the side of the road, which is, which is true or was true, right? Or maybe something like this. Yep, car parked by the side of the road, right? There is a car, there is a road. Right, so it's basically, it, I, it seems what it's doing or actually we know what it's doing because nearest neighbors works just as well on all these, as all these census management methods. What it's doing is just stealing appropriate caption from its data set. It's not really doing any, any reasoning. Geolocalization. So I'm a little bit biased, it's true. So you know, there is this uh, uh, Google, uh, 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 Google uh, uh, thing called Planet, very cool name. 
that, that worked very well. They have a huge deep, deep net and they have 81 million images for, for this geolocalization. And you know, James Hayes and I back in 2008, we had a humble little nearest neighbor thing. We had 6 million images, which I think was the largest, at that point, the largest data set of images uh, uh, ever assembled. Uh, but you know, we don't do as well, that's true. But notice that two things change here. First, the algorithm is different. But second, that the data is like an order of magnitude greater. So what happens if you actually hold one of them constant? Well, it turns out that the planet people, if you give them the same amount of data, they actually do a little bit worse than James Hayes' you know, hand-tuned nearest neighbor algorithm. So this, is, this should give you a pause, right? Because we have this, this in, inherent thing about thinking about the algorithm as the most important thing. And I think this is true across, across disciplines. In neuroscience, it's the same thing. It's all about the algorithm, right? So you, you want to write a NIPS paper, you come up with this amazing new algorithm, some three pages of formulas, and then like a week before you say, oh, wait, I need to have some features to run it, okay? And then the night before you say, oh, I need some data, okay? So you get like, you know, uh, you are, you know uh, UC Davis, whatever, mushrooms or whatever, and, and you publish your paper and you get famous, right? Uh, but Data is this kind of an afterthought. And I think this is fundamentally wrong. And, and I think we have been s stepping on this, on this rake over and over for a, for a long time. Uh, so this is another one of my, to kind of follow uh, uh, Michael's example of doing some kind of a historical overview. This is my little historical uh, slide on, on phase detection. So phase detection is really the, the, you know, the first success story in computer vision, right? It like, didn't work at all, and then suddenly, during, my, during the time I was in the PhD program, suddenly it started working so well that like, people started putting it in, their, in the camera, like the camera manufacturers started putting phase detection in their camera. So it's really a huge success story. So can somebody name me what was the paper that could have made phase detection from not working into working? Viola Jones, Adebus, thank you. Thank you. Adebus came out more or less in the same time. Rowley, Baruja, Kanadi was earliest. All three uh, got uh, the, the Mar Prize. Uh, all three did approximately the same. Uh, Schreiber and Kanadi had the best results. Viola Jones was the real-time one, although I think by 2001, uh, uh, Henry Schneidemann also got his system to be real-time. Um, but I don't remember Viola Jones. Well, because, you know, Raleigh had this, you know, the features were boring, like pixel, who cares? And the classifier was this old stuff that nobody, nobody used anymore called neural networks. <laughs> so, you know, it, it wasn't, yeah, people didn't get excited. Uh, Schneiderman Kanadi, okay, the, the features were a little bit excited, you know, more exciting, like, uh, you know, error would be, would, be, would be approving, you know, pairs of wavelet coefficients, but the classifier was so naive, right, naive Bayes, I mean, who wants that? Villa Jones had this really cool algorithm, boosted cascades, it's wonderful, it's beautiful, it's such a joy to, to teach it in a class. I still teach it in a class because it's a beautiful algorithm. It just didn't matter, because they all worked the same because the algorithm didn't matter and the feature didn't matter. You know what mattered? Data. Exactly. These were the first three papers in phase recognition and, and, and the, 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 the Poggio paper before that in, in, in detection that figured out that, oh, maybe we should use negative data as a, in addition to the positive data. So they were the first works that had images without faces to use as negative data. Okay? And that really was the thing that made it work. But do we remember this? No. We remember a boosted cascade because that gives us pleasure. It's kind of the scientific narcissism, you know. We prefer to credit our human cleverness instead of this, you know, nature which provides data and the humans are not even involved, right? And I think this is a, this is a, this is a, a dangerous thing if we want to be tr real scientists, because I think a lot of the, uh, the reasons things are working has to do not with our cleverness, but really with the data, okay? Um, I'm probably gonna uh, you know, repeat a little bit of what Antonio had been talking about. We have been 
early pushers for data for 15 years now. And um, so this, this, this is a wonderful little paper called Unreasonable Effectiveness of NATO uh, uh, that, uh, that basically argues this point very nicely. It basically says that things that, that in my elegant mathematics, we, have, we are done with those. We are basically, you know, like it's this joke about, you know, why does, uh, why does God uh, love physicists? It's because, you know, she gave them, uh, no, uh, how, the argument is that God prefers physicists to everyone else. Why? Because she gave them all the easy problems, right? And that is, and that is true. So you have in physics, yes, yeah, it's, 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 it's a complicated stuff, but, but explanations are all very compact, very simple. Chemistry, astronomy, etc., etc. And what's left are the mushy, nasty, you know, uh, things that, that, that are not simple. They're, they're, they're um, evolution complete things, right? And evolution is, is not clean. It's, it's, it, there is a lot of entropy. There is a lot of junk in there. And so that's why you don't have, a, you know, the first law of psychology or the second law of, of economics, right? The economics thought that they had, uh, you know, laws. And then, and then they, you know, the 2008 happened and they realized, oh, my God, you know, we shouldn't have tra treated uh, 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 people as, as rational agents, right? Um, and this is exactly where the magic of data comes in. It comes in in, this, in these kind of mushy evolution complete areas where we don't really have a neat, com uh, elegant, compact answers. The answers are going to be nasty and, and complicated and, and, and that's where the data comes in. And, and by kind of the, the, the implication here is that you know, brain dead lookup, aka nearest neighbor, often works surprisingly well. Now, everybody uh, thinks that I am a big fan of nearest neighbor and I just want to use a nearest neighbor for everything. It's not quite true. I because it, it shows you when the fancy methods don't actually do anything extra. It's, it's a fantastic baseline. My favorite, if I'm in a trolling mood, my favorite thing is to walk around in, you know, posters in, in CUPR and just keep asking people, so what's your nearest neighbor baseline? And either they haven't run it or they have run it and they say, oh, well, it's, uh, we are a little, we're, we're 1% better, right? Which really means that they run it enough times so they got better. It's very, very hard to beat nearest neighbor exactly because it, nearest neighbor is kind of the the, the baseline that says, okay, we're going to take stuff from the data and we're not going to do anything else. Okay, and this is, I, I'm sure Antonio showed you the, a wonderful paper that was very influential for me, the 80 million tiny images uh, data set, which showed that, look, if you have a lot of data, you don't really need to do anything because you will always find close enough stuff. And, and People don't know, but like all the stuff that you associate with ImageNet, like like you know WordNet, WordNet hierarchy and all that stuff, that was all in that little paper. So you could you could actually they did a little examples of kind of a, a recognition by going through the uh, WordNet tree and kind of uh, just having nearest neighbors vote on that. Um, and they even had a, 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 a unsupervised result on doing colorization. This is really cool. So basically, the idea is you you basically do nearest neighbor on the grayscale. Uh, part of the image, then you take whatever you know, the top hundred or top ten nearest neighbors, and you average their color and just put it in there, right? And it and it works, right? And the cool thing is, it doesn't work upside down, right? So this 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 is data kind of speaking to you, right? This is this is really neat for how stupid and simple it is. I mean, nearest neighbor always in the image pixel space. In pixel, yeah, but this is this is there are thirty two by thirty two pixels, so it's very simple, yeah. But this is like really stupid, right? But if you have 80 million tiny images, then distance in pixel space is going to be fine because you have enough data. So size does matter. Given enough data, most things will be closed by even, you know, if you don't really have a very smart distance metric. All, of course, you know, the smarter the distance metric, the better. Uh, you know, we did a, a few things, and I'll just show you because the pictures are nice, kind of in the same spirit. Want to you know get rid of this building? Want to fill in the hole? How do you fill in the hole? Well, we just download two million Flickr images and then find 
close enough one and you know do some graphics and it fills in the hole right and there's another one another one uh, sometimes it doesn't work but whatever <laughs> uh, here's another version you know get rid of this get a better view and why does it work well it's basically it is really about the data because we you know when we do started with this with James Hayes um, you know we, we we got what we thought was the biggest data set ever 20,000 images and it just didn't work. These were the nearest neighbors to this image, and they just didn't look very near. But it was about a, a month before SIGGRAPH deadline, and James thought, you know, during Christmas, why don't I just keep downloading these images? And when we came, we came back after Christmas, we got two million images, and it just started working. So nothing, like, the, the, the code did not change at all. It was just that we kind of scaled up the data, and it just started working. And then we could also do this kind of this, this uh, KNN in for, for, for other things, right? So if you have a label, you can just transfer the label. For example, this into GPS that I mentioned, we got to 6 million images, and then we basically just vote using nearest neighbor on the GPS location. And that's how, and that, that basically does better than the fancy schmancy Google uh, uh, ComNet uh, implementation, right? Because, you know, James, James did a nice job with the right the right feature space and, and it you know and it, it's really i mean it's not that it does better it basically does the same because it's really all about the data much more than about confnet now of course confnets can do other things they can do much more exciting things they can be compositional they can they can find mid-level representations but you know what for this task it probably didn't need to do any of that and that is why it basically didn't do any better than nearest neighbor. And I think we need to kind of be uh, aware of this, that the ComNet can do a lot of beautiful, marvelous things, but often it just doesn't want to do them. Yep? As I get more data here, the cost of the search increases, again, on a log scale, probably, but um, with a, a, a neural network, maybe I compile it all down into something with a fixed running cost. That's right, that's right, that's right. So if, like, it's not, like, I don't do nearest neighbor anymore. Now, this was, like, you know, a huge cluster and it took a long time but basically yeah I, I use my convnet as a nearest neighbor agent it's the baseline of a convnet is basically a nearest neighbor and i think what we need to make sure is that when we use a convnet we need to have a understanding of whether it's actually doing some nice mid-level representation learning or it's just doing nearest neighbor which is already very very impressive yep It, it was never there. This, this whole curse of dimensionality is just a, it's a scary tale for, uh, for you know, from, from, from middle, middle, uh, middle ages that it does make sense because the curse of dimensionality assumes that you're like distributed randomly, right? Uniform distribution. You're not distributed randomly. Uh, yes, yes. You Flickr images, basically every time you take a picture, you can guarantee that there is like a hundred thousand other Flickr users that took basically the same picture, yeah? Because there's not that much variability in, 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 in the world, right? There is just one Eiffel Tower. There is one Notre Dame, you know? Even this, even the, like this arc, I mean, how many times has this arc been photographed? Millions of times. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, so, so, Curse of dimensionality is only true when you have uniform distribution, but this distribution is not uniform at all. Okay, so the good news, really stupid algorithms, lots of data, you get this unreasonable effectiveness. Um, now, I heard from the back of this room say, well, wait a minute, but this is not, you know, biologically plausible. Surely the brain can't remember that much data, right? can be going through, searching for millions of images. And so that's why I thought I would, I would give you a little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a psychophysics test from my dear friend, Odd Oliver. And I love this. It's, it's a wonderful paper that everybody should know. Basically, what she was uh, evaluating is the she wanted to know the capacity of visual long-term memory, or even actually short-term memory, the capacity, capacity of visual memory. And um, that, that before, uh, the classic work by Standing in, in 73 that basically showed some very interesting results, that basically people were really, really good at remembering images. You know how when you, with words, you're at seven plus or minus two. So you, you give you a string of words, you'll remember, you know, uh, maybe nine if you're really, really good, okay? But with visual data, it seemed to be very different. 
So standing got a recognition rate of something like 83% on, on 10,000 images. Okay, but it's not clear what, um, the, the, all the images that standing showed were very, very different. So there was like an image of the beach and then there was an image of the forest and there was an image of the city. And so it's not clear how much information is retained, right? Because you can just remember beach or you can remember forest because all the images were quite different. And so what Odd did is that she decided to try to make this a harder task by showing not just very different objects, but also different exemplars from the same kind of object or even the same object but in different state. And then she wanted to see whether kind of the standing results, first, you know, can we replicate the standing results? And second, how does it work when you have harder, harder type of uh, uh, examples? Okay, and so um, we're actually going to do all of this together. Uh, uh, Odd kindly provided the slides. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, you're going to, I'm gonna sh show you lots and lots of images and then that you have seen and what you haven't seen, but so that you don't fall asleep, what Odd and we are going to do is that every time you see the same image twice, so ready? You're gonna, every time that you see an image second time, you're gonna clap, all right? Here we go. Very good. So we're pretty good, but let's see how good, how we go if we go farther. Uh oh. <laughs> Very good. Right? So I, I, I really wanted you to do this because like you don't really believe it until you do it. It's like, wow. Right? And of course, that what she does is that she, then she tests you either right after or I think like a week later. And, you know, for example, you know, which one did you see, A or B? A. Very good. What about A or B? A. B. Okay, how many A? How many bees? Look at that. That's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Okay, so indeed, uh, she replicated the standing result. In fact, it was even even better. She got 92 percent uh, recall for for the kind of the this the similar to standing. Uh, the question is, how did it work on the exemplars and how did it work on the state? So. Let's see. Oh. No, no, no. This, this is where we are going to guess. Um, psychologists get two points. Computer scientists get one point. Uh, so, you know, let's say no, no change goes down to chance and, you know, half, half performance. So who votes for no change? One. Who votes for down to chance? Huh? Prefer oh, yeah, that's true. Uh, down to chance, Im uh, improvement. Oh, look at that! Uh, what about half performance? Oh, I mean half. Half. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. Indeed, it's um, it's it's not even half. It's just a tiny little bit worse. Okay. So so this this made me very kind of uh, appreciative of of how much data is really being required and being consumed by us, the humans, and how much, how much detail is, is being preserved. 
So it almost looks like we're like, you know, we have photo photographic memory. We basically just gobble up every pixel, right? I think this is also maybe 10,000, maybe more. I think. Not 80 million. Huh? Not 80 million. Not 80 million. No, because the odd ran out of, a, of her grant. You know, you have to pay these people. <laughs> but would not her. I, I think, like, she didn't observe any degradation in performance. It, it was just very expensive once you keep people for more than five hours. Do you know what percentage of the uh, images people could name? For which images for which they had, like, we have bread and bread box. Right, or, right, right, right. There was a Schwabian um, Spetzler made, for example, and mm -hmm. very few people would recognize that uh, as an actor. Right. I was impressed that you had a Schwabian. That, yeah, I'm, I, that, she didn't, again, this is nothing to do with me. I'm just channeling odd here. Um, I, think, I think some of these, like, for example, the different, um, the different uh, what are they called, remote controls, I don't think you'd be able to name the different, like a Sony versus a Panasonic. I don't think you can do that, right? Maybe this, you can kind of... If they were unfamiliar objects. Right. If, you could, if I can't name it, it's probably an unfamiliar object. That's right. And that might impact my, is my memory purely visual? That's right. I tie it to a... That's right, that's right, that's right. That's, so, yes, so you should, it's, it's hard to get unfamiliar, or I, I, unless I guess you can go to like, you know, art, you know a, a contemporary art museum and get some weird sculptures there. Uh, but, but it does get better because Odd has done a follow-up study that it's not even published, but I, I got some slides from her, um, where she used, uh, she used Aero's wonderful texture synthesis method to create images that had the first and second uh, 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 order statistics of a real image, but of course were not real images, okay? And then she did the same thing for these kind of images, okay? And now, what's the prediction? Now, if, if we believe that it's basically we're like photo, pho photographic memory, it should be basically the same. I think it's going to get worse. How much worse? Okay. Okay. So, unfortunately, the, the slide she gave me is not the same. But my understanding is it basically went to chance. Basically, this things then it's not just that being unfamiliar object. I bet it's just unfamiliar everything. Not just not getting there at all. So I think this is and this is why I you know this is why learning is 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 cool. Right? This is why we need learning, because we need a way for the computer to figure out whether you are on the manifold of natural images, because it's clear that humans are, are able to do that, that we, humans are indeed somehow negotiating uh, the, the, the representation uh, abyss somehow. Okay? And so, but, but, but this is, I think, a very cool result that suggests that we are really, really good at memorizing tons of stuff, but we are memorizing them in a representation that is connected with, 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 with the statistics of the natural world. It's not, just, it's not just stupid, you know, L2 memorization kind of thing, okay? So, and of course, you know, learning, learning is basically trying to get kind of that sense, to get a representation based on the data. And you can think of, you know, the whole learning spectrum. This is Antonio's slide. You have, you know, what the right thing to do, which is extrapolation. That's what everybody wants to do with generalization, blah, blah, blah. And, and we already heard about the Van der Mars, Malsbrook stuff. This is like a, the, the fundamental quintessential extrapolation problem. You have a very s simple model. You have almost no data. And then you kind of uh, explain the universe. And then there is the kind of the... the the bastard child, the interpolation problem, where you have lots and lots of images and you're basically just interpolating between the things that you know to, to understand what you're not knowing, right? And the story was always like, everybody wants to get that way, and right now the best thing that works is somewhere kind of on the, on the nearest neighbor side. And the argument was always that humans are also that way. And I think 
what at least what I took from odds experiments is that actually humans are much more on this side than we are comfortable uh, 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 admitting. And of course, where are the confidence? Where is the deep learning? Deep learning is like way over here because deep learning really needs the data. Deep learning is super data hungry. Yeah. Yes, but, but you have seen so much other stuff before that. The one-shot learning is not really a fair setup because you're not, you're, you're not tabula rasa. Right? You have seen a couple of billion images in your first two years. Sure, 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 sure. But, but, but you, know, you can't just say, oh, it's a prior, right? Because what is a prior? You know? Prior is, is data that somebody else has collected. So you still need the data. It, 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 it's not, it's like, you, you don't really ever have one-shot learning because the one-shot learning hides the fact that before that there was a huge amount of data that somehow got into the system. Right, you, you, you okay, you, you know, first time somebody points out, you know, a Volkswagen Beetle, and then, then your kid can say, oh, you know, you can recognize it with one shot. But the kid probably saw a bunch of these Volkswagen Beetle just driving on the street before, right, without the label. And if not, that they, they have seen a lot of kind of, uh, kind of parts of that Volkswagen Beagle. So it's never, it's never from scratch. You, always, you already have a very nice uh, scaffolding ready to, to take in this one-shot learning. I mean, okay, how you represent that, all I'm arguing is that there is a lot of bits that get into the brain. How they live there, I, the, hopefully the neuroscientists can figure this out or the psychophysicists. All I'm arguing for is that there is a lot of information. In fact, that is, the, the cool thing is, you know, the, 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 the neurons are, you know, the neurons are, or at least the model of the neurons that we have, like a Comnet type model, right? It's very, very simple. So where is the magic? Well, the magic is in the data. How, how it does its magic? I don't know. I think this is a great question. But I am absolutely sure that that's the, the magic sauce. But doesn't the, the bread box example, where there's a mm -hmm. change of state, mm -hmm. feels much more like the left-hand side to me, that there's a spatial relationship between the bread and the and the affordances of the object, it could be inside or outside, and it feels much more like the explicit thing on the left than the thing on the left. The pixels are all kind of the same. That, that, that could be, but then how do you explain the, the, do, the different remote controls? There, it's really just, just you memorize the texture, yeah. right? So, yeah, I don't know. I, look, I love Gibson. I, I would love to have this kind of affordance-based thing, but, you know, we need to be honest about what is, what's in the data, and, and, and it seems like a lot of the time it's just raw memorization, you know, gets you a, a, a long part of the way. So, comnets do have high capacity. I think that's really what, what made them suddenly, you know, work, right? That, that all of our other machine learning models just were really underpowered. And finally, there was a model that, that could memorize data really, really well. Uh, it can memorize, in fact, everything. There is a wonderful paper by, from Ben Rex's group that shows that you can, you can memorize the wrong labels, and it's perfectly fine. It, it, it takes a little bit longer time to, to train it, but it, 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 it's able to memorize random labels uh, on ImageNet as opposed to the correct labels. It's fine. Okay? So it's really good at just memorizing stuff. But despite the huge capacity, confidence just love to cheat. And... I would like to argue that the blame lies not on the architecture or anything else. It lies on, on the data. It lies, in fact, on the labels, on the user-supplied semantic labels. Um, why? And, 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 and let, me, let, me, let me see if I can sell you on this argument. 
So, you know, why, you know, what, what the kind of a classic computer vision task is. You know, you give an image and then you have, you want to produce, you know, you, you want to understand picture and you want to, you know, one kind of classic way of understanding it is with words. So you, you basically give words to the picture, picture and then you see how well you do. But the problem is that, you know, you, 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 know, you, you don't want to use many different words, so now you have to categorize. Now, now you have a word for sky, a word for building, street lamp, face, banner, car, bus, wall, etc. Right? But the problem is that if this is your understanding of the image, you know, you, you, you know how they say that an image is worth a thousand words? But here we have about ten. And if you give this ten words and their placement to an artist, no way they're, they're going to get back to this. It's completely, information has been lost. It's not a reversible thing, right? You have lost a ton of information. Um, so the visual world and the world of words, this, this, this category, semantics, whatever you have it, it's a much smaller world, and I'm not sure why we're doing this, except for maybe some kind of caption generation task. Okay, if your output is, is linguistic, that's fine. But if your output is not linguistic, why are we doing this kind of funneling, right? So here's another, my favorite examples. So this is uh, uh, Pittsburgh downtown, where I spend uh, a long time, and this is Paris, where I wanted to spend a long time. Um, and by some fluke of the English language, they happen to be denoted by the same noun. But there is nothing in common between them. <laughs> I mean, you can say, well, you know, the, 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 they both have buildings. But look at the buildings. The buildings are completely different. So, well, but the buildings have windows. The buildings are completely different. They're in a, any kind and any kind of a level of the hierarchy, it's completely different. And so you're pushing the poor classifier. You're, you're t by telling them that these two things are somehow related you're making the poor classifier suffer because they aren't actually related. They're related maybe, you know, functionally or, or, or culturally, but they're not related visually. And so now you're, you're not only are you not one-to-one, -one, but it's not even, if it's, it's not even helpful to, to group them into the same, the same group, okay? And, and in fact, this is, I think, why, um, why classifiers trained with linguistic labels, like to cheat. And I've been, I've been using the, the, the dog example from, from Matthias for, for a couple of years now because I love it so much. Because I think it's, it illustrates this point very well, right? That you have this you know, uh, image in, label out, everything looks great, but then you do a little bit of texture synthesis and it's perfectly fine. So you think that, okay, it, you know, it's supposed to do figure ground, it's supposed to find uh, uh, you know, object boundaries, it's supposed to se segmentate. No, it doesn't need to do any of that. It's basically just doing texture. Texture is perfectly enough to solve this task because the task is not that hard. The task is, you know, a thousand classes. A thousand way classifier and you don't even get punished if you, get, if you are in the top five. So it's really like a, a hundred, uh, 200 way classifier, more or less, right? So, so, so you're really not, don't, you don't need to do that much. The classifier can cheat because the task it's asked to do is not that hard, yeah? Yeah, you mentioned it should segment, but it should segment if you train it in segmentation, right? No, the, yeah, yeah, but... If you, but, you put such rich text or images through, you actually will have a change now. But. Sure, sure, of course, but, but yeah. what it's, what, what, for humans, we are segmenting objects because it, it helps us doing whatever humans do, right? So the segmentation emerges as an as a, as a intermediate representation for the task at hand. It does not emerge for the task of image net classification because it's too, too simple of a task. And now, this is not, by the way, limited to ComNets. In fact, follow from um, Michael's historical story. This is almost a true story, I think. Very vaguely true story. Um, in the... Um, in, in the 70s, DARPA wanted to, to detect tanks in photographs. DARPA didn't exist in the 70s. Uh, yes, ARPA. Um, uh, it gave the universities a bunch of money, and it even provided some, you know, some pictures with tanks and some pictures without tanks, and, you know, they basic, you know, they spend five years' worth of grant money, and then five years later, the big general comes, wheels in a tank, 
and it completely fails. Anyone in, knows what was the problem? There must be some. This is a very famous story. All, the, all, all of the tank images were taken during sunny days. All the non-tank images were taken on a cloudy day. And the classifier did the only reasonable thing it could do. It's like, look at, okay, what's the difference between those two sets? Boom, done. It's a, basically after, after you know, several million dollars, they produced a cloudy versus sunny detector. Okay? It's not, this is not a new problem. Um, another example uh, on in action classification, you have a video, you know, here your uh, hand comes out, opens the fridge door, there is a fridge, closes the door, and then you want to, do, you know, again, classify it, you know, is this, is this picking up cop action? No. Is it slicing bread action? No. Is it opening fridge action? Yes. Right? And there's like 20 labels or whatever. And it, again, that's very, very well in this text, 90 whatever percent on this. But if you look at this, basically all action recognition uh, papers, if you reshuffle the frames, it works just as well. So basically bag of frames works just as well as, as a contiguous video. But here it's actually even worse than that because it doesn't even care about all of the frames. It really just looks at that frame. So again, it doesn't care about the hand. It doesn't care about the, the fridge door. It really cares about the open fridge texture. It's again doing texture recognition. Okay. Um, and if you asked me about this two years ago, I would have told you uh, the problem is data set bias, right? You don't, you don't have just open fridges in your, as your negative set, right? So what you do is you go to Costco, there's a whole bunch of open fridges, you, you take pictures of them, you put it as your negative set, and then, and then that kind of a fixes that problem. Now, I'm not so sure about this. I think that basically the, the data set bias will never go away just because data is finite. So you're kind of basically playing this walk -a -mole. You Every time you can fix one problem and something else will get, get, get stick, stuck out. So I don't think we will be able to outsmart the classifiers. I think the classifiers will always be able to cheat if they want to cheat. So somehow we need to figure out a way to make them not want to, to cheat, even if, if they could. Okay? So we need to somehow figure out a better w way to use the data that we have and steer the, the classifier into doing something that aligns with, with what we want. Um, and because if you think about the direct supervision, that's not really what we want to do. So direct supervision is basically memorization. It's kind of like in, um, you know, in my computer vision class this fall over the spring, you know, a bunch of people didn't come to class, which was very sad because, you know, it, it, they were, I, I thought that the lectures were pretty good. But, um, but then, you know, the night before, they're like, oh my God, oh my God, the final exam comes, what do I do? They get the, 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 the final exams from previous years, and they basically just do this kind of a direct supervision. Question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, question, answer, right? They memorize the, all the previous exams, then they go in for the final exam, and they do fine, right? They do pretty well because the, the exams are not that different because there isn't really that much different things you can ask in computer vision. They're all kind of a, you know, standard six-point algorithm, whatever problems, right? And, and so, they actually pass the task, they get their A, but have they learned the material? No. And I think this is really what's happening with, with us. We, we're, we're breeding a generation of, of, of computer vision algorithms that are doing very well cramming for the test and not really well on actually learning the material. And so we need somehow to figure out how to make the computer study harder. Okay? And, and so... To, to, to figure this out, I thought, okay, let, let's take, like a, let's take a st step back. Why, why do we even have vision? Okay, so we can go and see what, you know, you know, what Mar says about this, and Mar basically quotes Aristotle, who says that we have vision to see what's where by looking. And you can see that basically you have, you have a, you know, a ventral and dorsal story here if you're a neuroscientist, or you have the recognition and, 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 and the localization story if you're a computer vision person, right? It's, it's somehow very, 
very homey and, 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 and friendly story, but it's not really a very good explanation, I think. I, first of all, it's, it's false uh, 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 objectively just because your visual cortex sees something. What is it, 20, uh, 50, 60 milliseconds have passed, so you're actually already not seeing the present, you're seeing the past. So in a, in a, in a, in a world that changes fast, you're not going to see what is where. You're, you're going to see what was, was the where uh, in the past. And then if you don't do any kind of you know, a, a, you know, a, a prediction, you, you, you are not going to survive very well. But even fundamentally, it's not really that we need to see what is where. That's, that's kind of all, you know, side byproduct. Really, what we need vision for, if you kind of go down this rabbit hole, boom, 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 eventually, to make babies who make more babies, right? That, that is really the only objective function that, 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 is, uh, that is out there. Everything else is incidental, right? Um, and so, so, you know, one way would be to just say, okay, let's just, let's just code up evolution and then wait for a vision to emerge. Unfortunately, maybe not quite realistic at this point. And so, maybe we can think of some kind of an intermediate objective that is not so immediate as, 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 as the, the Mar Aristotle one, but, but maybe good enough for us. And I would argue that that objective is a prediction objective. And, and I'm not alone in this. There is a plenty of people who have been uh, arguing for this. Uh, Moshe Barr from the neuroscience side, the whole proactive brain. Uh, Jan Kundrich has, has uh, written uh, uh, about this as well, and, and, and many others. And, and this, I think, is, a, is, a, is, a, is an interesting thing because it's really kind of a driver. It's, in a sense, a kind of a driver to evolution, right? It basically says, I want, to, um, I want to predict farther than you do. And that's how we compete. We compete on knowing farther into the future. And, and in that sense, you can think of this as the world acting as your supervision, right? You somehow you're predicting some aspect of the world, and then you know you just you just wait or just look around, and then you get your answer, right? So what's going to happen next? Okay, you make a prediction, and then you wait, and in a couple of seconds you will know the answer, and then you know if you're right or wrong, and if you're wrong, you can adjust, right? The same thing for other kind of prediction tasks. You can get the label directly from your environment, from your world. You don't have to rely on on a human clicking. The, the, the world itself is your supervision. And this is why I've been very excited about this, this, this area of self-supervision, where you're basically using data as its own supervision. Okay? Now, this might be, sound similar to something, something uh, else that, 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 that people uh, have already heard in, during this, this uh, week, autoencoders. Right? Autoencoders is a way to represent a, an image with some sort of a compact code. And how do you train it? You train it using a reconstruction law. So you're basically saying, reconstruct me that, that, that image, uh, original image. But um, the, 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 the bottleneck here is smaller, so you need to kind of do this kind of compression. Right? Is that cell supervision? It's, it's, uh, it's not quite well defined, but I would claim that it's not quite self-supervision because it's really about data compression, right? You're, you're really compressing, and, and compression is, is, is related to machine learning, of course, but it's not quite machine learning because compression really cares about the training set. It doesn't really care that much about what's, happening, hap what's going to happen at test time. And so what... What we argue is that maybe we need to make, and, and in practice, uh, autoencoders are very fi finicky, and we haven't been able to make them work well for, for any uh, uh, real size data. So like it works great on M MNIST, CIFAR, but it doesn't really work well on, 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 on full-sized images. Uh, and the argument is that it's basically just, it's again, the, 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 the algorithm does, is not pushed enough. It's not working hard enough. And so to make it work hard enough, let's turn this into a, a data prediction problem where 
we are not just replicating the, the, the input. We are given part of the input, for example, and we are trying to predict the other part of that input. Okay? Now you actually need to ha work harder. Now you actually need to, need to do a little bit more. You're being pushed a little bit farther. And, and indeed, the, the self-supervision story has been, um, one of the earlier papers on this has been from Virginia Dessa, proposing it as a way to connect and to cross-train different modalities, for example, audio and visual one, uh, as, as, this, as this way to having them cross-predict each other. Um, and, and, and basically, you know, but now it's gone kind of all, you know, much bigger than that. And so here, here's my little partial taxonomy of different kinds of self-supervision. Um, the, the kind of the, the simplest one, and this is what I kind of showed you, is you are doing data prediction. So you, you slice your data into two halves, let's say. Given one half, you're predicting the other half, okay? But you don't want to predict pixels. Maybe you want to predict something else. So what you can do is you can have, you can transform your data by some transformation, and then you're given both the untransformed data and the transformed data, and then the network uh, is trying to predict what was the transformation that, that, that you had to do to, to, to predict this. Um, this, is, this is nicer because you're predicting something low dimensional, so uh, things work better this way uh, often. Uh, the third one, for lack of a better name, we call it meta supervision. And the argument here is that you're basically, you're supervising not with data and not with a transformation, but you're supervising with the constraints on, on, on that data, okay? And those constraints could be something like that data needs to live in some, on some sort of manifold. I don't know what it is, but it needs to obey these, these certain constraints, okay? And so these are the kind of three parts. And so I'm just going to go and give examples from my, from my, from my lab's work on, on, uh, on kind of examples of, 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 of these three. Yep. So is the defining difference between self-supervision and unsupervised learning just that there's a different domain and range? Well, a lot of, most of unsupervised learning is basically clustering. So that, that's even, even a weird thing. Well, like reconstruction, it's like input and back to That's right, that's right. But, but like clustering is not that, right? Yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I don't know. I, yeah, I, I don't know how. I think autoencoders are a little kind of off the side thing. I think mostly unsupervised learning is, is a variations on clustering. Um, yeah, okay. So now some examples of this. So one of the simplest to think about is uh, we did a work on colorization. So you take a, you take a color image, you split it into a uh, grayscale part and a color part, and now you train your network to go from, from grayscale to color, and the nice byproduct is that you get this nice uh, 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 color, 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 colorized images as a result. Again, it might, you know, for those of you caring about, uh, you know, biological plausibility, who knows, maybe the rods and the cones are like self-predicting each other, and maybe that's, you know, that could be part of learning, whatever. But Ansel Adams, make it color, and you know other famous photographs, but of course what we care about is what gets learned in there. Can you actually learn the representation that it's kind of going to do something reasonable in there by doing this very kind of low-level prediction task? Um, and indeed, um, it's it's looking good because here is an example of a failure that tells you that maybe things are looking looking good. Do you see what's different here? That's right. There is a pink splotch where underneath the mouth. So why is it there? Well, if you look at the training data, you realize that most of the time this type of dogs have their tongue out. And so this is actually a very, very good news because what that means is it's not doing some low level image processing mumbo jumbo. It's actually doing some sort of a kind of a semantic recognition. It's knowing that it's a dog. It's knowing that it's this kind of dog and expecting to see the tongue. 
So we did a little bit of deep net electrophysiology here. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I, I think uh, uh, Antonio must have showed you this, uh, this uh, the, 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 um, the, the way that that's done, but we basically just pick some random uh, neurons and basically see where they fire the most and show the images where they fire the most. And we're basically just by going through them, we found that you know, there is, we found a neuron that responds to sky, trees, water, faces, dog faces, flowers, right? And again, this is something that you never had any semantics in the system at all, right? It, it started out doing this very simple pretext task, colorization, and yet it was able to have these kind of representations emerge from the data, which I think is very exciting. Um, and, you know, we had data prediction examples as well. In addition to colorization, we also did hole filling that, 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 that worked, you know, similarly. And we also thought, okay, you know, the problem with these kind of things is when you, you're conditioning on half the data and then you predict the other half of the data, you're kind of throwing half the data away. So your presentation only deals with half of the data. So why can, let's, can we use all of the data? And so here, what we do is we basically take one of these predictors and then put another one next to it, but the task. Okay, and we call it split brain autoencoder, right? Because if you look at, pro, if you squint and look at this, it's basically like an autoencoder, right? And now it kind of goes from the full data to the full data, but instead of doing compression, it does two prediction tasks. So yep. You were, it sounded like you were criticizing unsupervised learning as clustering, but why in the preceding slide is it not that the network is actually learning to cluster flowers and sky and faces and why is that not clustering? Oh, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not criticizing clustering. Clustering is wonderful. Okay. K-means is not so good, right? I, so I love discriminative clustering, for example, right? I think, I think the idea of, like, unsupervised learning is really like, you know, you, you find patterns in data without, without, without anything. And maybe there will be a, like a magical clustering algorithm that will work very well. But right now, all we have is variants of k-means, and it's just not a very good clustering algorithm. Here, what we are doing is we're using the stuff that works well, supervised learning, right? That's a machine that just works really, really well. But we are using that machine to use, to, uh, no, without having the labels, but having data as the label. So we're using the machinery of supervised learning in a setup that is unsupervised. And that's roughly what self-supervised learning is called. So we, kind of, we steal the machinery from the supervised guys, but we are using it in an unsupervised way. Okay? And, but the hope is that because we have so much more labels and so much more data, and so we have so much, so much different things we, we can predict, the supervision, this, this kind of supervision is stronger, and it's, so it's, it will prevent the, 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 the methods from cheating because it, there is just way more constraints. Although that is, you know, to be determined still. Okay? Um, so, information prediction, here's another, uh, uh, kind of the, the second part of it is, so sometimes predicting pixels is maybe not what you want to do. And maybe it's, it's too much, especially like, you know, you know, predicting the future, for example. You, 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 it's not clear that you really want to predict it in pixel space. Um, so this is our, one of our earliest papers trying to do this. Again, I think it's good to do a little bit of psychophysics on it. So imagine that you are a computer, you're given two patches from the same image, and your task is to figure out what is their spatial arrangement. So where is B in respect to A? Okay? So let's see. Imagine that you're a computer and try to do this task. Bottom right corner. Bottom right corner. Very good. Now let's do a little introspection. I know the psychophysicists are not supposed to do that, but how did you know this? I can see the rear view mirror and the, and the, the wheel is close to the ground. Okay. And the rear view mirror means it's close to the front and the express sign it has to be at the front. Uh, uh, the front of what? The bus. Ah, yeah. It's a bus. And so if it's a bus, then this is probably the top of the bus, this is probably the front of the bus, there is a rear view mirror. Now I can solve the problem here and then I can make it, right? Imagine now that you did not ever seen a bus in your entire life. Would you be able to do this task? 
I claim no, right? And this is kind of the kind of the insight into this kind of self-supervised learning. You want to have a pretext task that tricks you into learning what you actually wanted to learn. So now, by forcing the computer to solve this task over and over and over, the argument is that we'll have to learn about buses because it cannot do the task without it. There's a little bit of Manhattan world geometry here, though, also because yeah. of the straight lines. And yeah. I some, if I knew about boxes and Manhattan world, I might still be able to at least position it. Yeah, yeah. You could, there are some priors that you can, that you can do. And what we do also, uh, you know, we basically take patch, take a bunch of patches around it, and do it over and over and over again. But you notice that the patches that we take, first there is some white space between the patches, and we need to do this because otherwise we, it can just look at texture and basically cheat by looking at texture continuity. And we also made the patches wobble a little bit, and that kills the, the, the collinearity or the straight line thing because that is another way that it can cheat. So yeah, so you, we, one has to be careful. But once, once you do that, then you have, you train a big uh, Siamese net, give it a pair of patches, and then classify it as one of the eight, eight-way classifier, and then we do it for like five weeks, right? So this is a, actually a hard task. It's a much harder task than ImageNet, uh, uh, and, and so it takes a lot of training. But again, the cool thing is that at the end, you have a representation that seems like it's, it's doing something reasonable. And you know, there, we have various ways of doing this here. I will just show you uh, one, one visualization to, to maybe try to convince you that it's doing something reasonable. And we're just going to do nearest neighbors here, but we're going to do nearest neighbors in this embedding space computed by the, by the network, okay? And so what we're going to do is we're going to take a, an input patch that we haven't seen before, and then we're going to do nearest neighbor to find other patches that have the same or very similar representation. And what do you see here is actually very cool because what you see is you see a correspondence emerge across instances, even though it has never been taught about categories. It has never been shown two pictures of cats uh, or told that this is the same thing. It, it, it figured out how to make a category basically using context as the cue. Okay, and this is very much uh, related and inspired by the, the word to vec uh, 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 algorithm in, 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 in language, right? You're using context to figure out how to connect instances together. And so you get, you get your clustering, you get your, uh, your, your, your categories, but they emerge. They're not told to you by the human. They emerge from a reasonably low level process. And I think this is kind of exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, did you try nearest neighbors? Oh, of course. I just, these look like nearest neighbors in pixel space. That, no, no. So, yeah, yeah. So, in the paper, we have. Uh, well, okay. So, pixel space, people, pixels don't work at all. Uh, but, hog, actually. Hog, like doing, like for wheels, hog is beautiful. So, yeah. So, we have, we have all the comparisons. For some things, indeed, hog works pretty well. For cats, it definitely does not work. Okay, yeah, but, but that's very, very good point, very good point. Okay? Are you, are you doing this with colored images? I remember vaguely that you had a problem with... There was a trick, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm skipping the, the details. Yeah, so it inadvertently lo learned a chromatic aberration, and we had to deal with it, actually. So we are, we just kind of... Huh? You, now it's working on colored images. So, no, no, it, it, we're still using color, but we are subtracting away... Uh, the, the, the principal component in the color space that, that uh, the, the chromatic aberration was, was focused on. But yeah, yeah that was, there was some, another, another tale for another time. Uh, let's see, how, how are we doing? Well, I can, I can show you another, another example of, 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 uh, of this kind of a, uh, predicting transformation. This is, this is uh, something that, again, was, we are very inspired by by, by, um, by biology. Um, the McGurk effect is something that, that, that is very, very cool. Let me see if it works. So there's a dude, and he's saying ba. Nothing, nothing complicated now, right? Now, so 
most people hear fa with an F, but actually the audio is exactly the same. The only thing that's different is that he looks like he's saying fa, and the brain basically, you know, predicts predicts the wrong thing because of, because of the visual. So why is this exciting? It's exciting because it seems that the, 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 the visual and the auditory modalities are actually, they start interacting reasonably early. It's not a late kind of thing. It seems that it's, it's, it's happening reasonably early. And a computer vision story where you, we have a CNN for video, CNN for audio, and not, never the two shall meet, seems, seems not quite right. And so we thought, okay, let's try to see if we can have uh, a joint kind of multi-sensory representation that kind of represents the video and the audio and connects the two. And we are going to, again, train it using self-supervision. Uh, and the self-supervision is basically going to be kind of a, a classic one where you're going to say, let's train a pretext task that says, can separate the real pairs from fake pairs. For example, this is a real pair of audio and video. Okay, so this is an actual piece of video. And for fake ones, okay, what do we do for fake? Well, we can take some random, vi uh, uh, random video from YouTube and then just use its audio. Okay, so that's fake. The problem is it's too fake. This is just too easy, right? It's, it, you don't, the, again, the classifier is just going to cheat. And so, and it doesn't even need motion analysis because it just basically looks and says, oh, that's not a street scene, done, right? And so instead, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be doing something a little bit harder. We're going to take the original audio and then we're going to shift it a little bit just to screw with the algorithm, okay? And now it's harder problem and it's a problem where you actually need to look at the video. A still frame or a bag of frames, just not good enough anymore. You actually need to do visual, video processing. And the cool thing is that as soon as you give a task that requires video, CNN is perfectly happy to look at it. So all the same CNNs that, that before that couldn't care about video at all, now they care about video because the task is, is such that it has to. Right? Because it basically has to figure out that there is a displacement between the audio and the, and the, and the video, and it needs to figure out that, you know, that, that displacement. Okay? And so basically, that's, that's the whole task. And again, we train for a bunch of weeks uh, on, again, lots and lots of uh, uh, YouTube videos. And, and then we can do fun things like we can visualize the pixels in the videos that are most useful for predicting the audio. Basically, we can visualize where, where the classifier is looking when it does this task. And so here is, here is an example of the, the pixels for uh, which the classifier is looking at when it's doing this task of, uh, of uh, figuring out the right or wrong alignment. Okay? And you can see that like the water it doesn't care about at all, but it does care about chopping wood here, right? And it, you know, it's not quite clear where, where the sound is coming from, but it's basically kind of at least localizing it somewhat, okay? Uh, and then we thought, okay, we could actually do this for, uh, for something useful. And we thought, can we then use this to, to separate the on-screen from off-screen uh, 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 speech? In, in, in a video, okay? So like you have a, uh, some, you know, some world leader and a translator behind the screen. Um, now we thought that we would be like the first ones to ever do this because this is like super, super crazy thing. Turns out like there is like three other papers that came out at the same time, but it's okay, everybody got published. We are all cross-citing each other. We are the only ones that are kind of completely unsupervised though, self-supervised, so, so we are still <coughs> happy with that. Uh, but basically, the idea is that we are, we are going to use our pre-trained features to then do another self-supervised task of trying to split the audio into the audio that has evidence in the pixels from the audio that doesn't have evidence in the pixels. Okay? And again, we trained this for a while, but it, it is important, though, to have been pre-trained using our feature. And now we can do something like this. So this is the input.
Okay, and now we can do the just just the on screen. Just the audio. And then we could do the opposite too. Okay. Okay, so finally, meta supervision. Meta supervision is again this amorphous thing. Let me define it by kind of giving you examples. So direct supervision is kind of the standard thing. F of X gets label Y. You're supervising directly with a label Y. But what if you don't want to supervise with a label Y? What if you want to supervise with some kind of a property or constraint on F of X? For example, you can say, what if I know that F of X should be in the domain capital Y? What is this? That's a GAN. Okay? So this basically provides a, a nice self-supervised constraint which says, I don't know what the, what, the, what the actual answer is. I'm not going to supervise the answer, but I'm going to tell you the constraints on possible answers. Okay? Uh, have you guys, um, have people talked to you about GANs already? Okay, why don't I give you a, a little tiny thing about my, a couple of cool things about GANs that I like. So first, GANs, I think, are really great uh, for, for kind of designing loss functions. So, for example, if you want to do colorization or you want to do super resolution or whatever, if you just do it as a regression problem, it doesn't work. It, it, it looks all blurry and bad because regression basically, the multimodality kills you. Regression just going to predict the, the, the average and the average is going to be bad and blurry. So you could do some crazy, you know, hacks by hand and try to make it better. Or you can say, what, isn't there a way to just have this universal loss? That just, just, I want it to just look good. And we know this is, exists because, you know, our graduate students do this, right? This, this is what happens if you write, you know, write a SIGGRAPH paper. You basically iterate until it looks good. So we know it's possible, but graduate students are expensive. So what, can, what else can we do? Well, we can also do um, you know, mechanical Turk, right? So we can actually show, we can show mechanical Turkers the result of our algorithm and actual real images, and we can say which one is real and which one is not real. And if the Turkers are a chance, then we know we are doing well. So this is good for, for evaluation, and this is indeed what we do for, to evaluate our algorithms, but you cannot really backprop through mechanical Turkers. Um, and this is, a, this is where GANs come in, right? So basically, one way to think about it is that they replace the Turkers with another classifier. So instead of the Turkers telling, is this a real image or not, now we have a, a classifier that is trying to, to figure out if it's a real image or not, and if it's able to do that, it tells the generator how it was able, where it was able to figure this out, and so it tells the generator to work harder, and then you have this whole kind of, kind of a competition, and this is kind of one example of this, of this task for con uh, conditional GAN. So the generator G tries to synthesize fake images to fool D, and D is trying to identify the fakes. And the nice way to think about this, and this is uh, uh, Phil Isola's uh, insight, is um, is that from G's perspective, D is basically like a loss function. D is like L1 or L2 or whatever, but it's a learned loss function. And it's, it's speci specially trained for that particular task. Okay? And so that's kind of the nice, the nice way to, to think about this, in that you're basically getting, GANs are getting you a, a, a way to tell you how well you're doing and pushing you towards, towards a good answer. The, and the answer is the answer that, that makes it look like an image in a particular domain. In this particular case, the domain of natural images. So it's, it's pushing you towards the, the domain of, of, of the, the, the natural image manifold. And then you can do, you know, colorization and you can go from uh, whatever, from, from Google Street View to, to satellites, and you can go back, and you can go from day to night. It's the same algorithm, uh, you know, thermal to RGB, you can do edges to images, or you can do Q 
kid sketches to images, and we also, you know, just, just a little bit of a, a cute little thing, we can say, you know, we, now we can use things like open pose to again create our own training data for us, and then we can do our picks to picks to go from the essentially a sketch back to the image. Now that's not very useful kind of as a loop, but what we can do is we can now use the, the, the pose as an intermediate representation and get our grad students to go dancing. And so here is an example of, this is the, the source object, and this is a couple of grad students, and they are dancing much better now. Okay. I mean, not, not perfect, but you know, for like a little paper, not so bad. Okay. Um, and another thing that I promised to mention, because I have this such uh, august people in the audience, uh, both Aero and Matthias, um, this is something that I've been thinking about, but I really don't really, I don't have any, it's just kind of an intuition. But basically, I think GANs can be thought of as generalized texture synthesis. So as again, if you remember, texture is, uh, um, te texture analysis is basically you have, you have this kind of infinite texture image out there in the world somewhere. But all you have is you have samples from it, right? And what you need to do is you want to have a way to kind of realize that the, those samples are from the same texture or maybe even create new samples that come from the same texture but not the same image, right? That's kind of the whole beauty of uh, texture, uh, texture analysis. And the reason, like, I, I did my PhD uh, on, uh, on texture and in a sense you can think of texture as like a big data in miniature. Right? In a single image of texture, you actually have tons and tons and tons of different samples of that texture. So it's kind of a, a nice case study. And of course, Bela Eulish is the kind of the father of texture. He, he argued for this idea that humans can not dis dis distinguish between two texture samples if, if, they, if their first and second order statistics match. Okay? then they basically they look indistinguishable. Now, the, the conjecture was proven wrong, but I think it's true in, in spirit, it's, it's still true. So here's an example, of, so you know, have two textures. The first order statistics just means that there's less points on the one side, and obviously you can see the, the boundary, but with second order statistics, you can also see the boundary very well. And, you know, and the argument is if you go to third order, then you, you, will, you will not be able to see the boundary, right? And this is really what, what kind of uh, got a lot of people excited, but of course the big question is like, what are those features? What are the, the, the Eulish's text talks? And, um, and the argument in the beginning was maybe let's just take the filter bank uh, outputs as, the, as those features. And this was the, the Hugo and Bergen paper that was a really nice paper that basically says, let's take a random, uh, random image, uh, noise image, and take a, a texture image, compute st histograms, statistics of that texture image, and those are basically just histograms of filter outputs. And then coerce this noise image to, to have those same statistics at different levels. So basically they split it into a pyramid, and then they basically coerced every level of the pyramid to have matching statistics, then they collapse the pyramid, do it again a few times, and in the end, you get this beautiful piece of, of texture, right? I'm, yeah, gonna skip it. And so, kind of way to think about this, and this is a arrow slide that I stole. Um, so you have, you have some kind of a sample of texture in image space, and you, you start with a noise image, you push it to, in the model space, in the space of, uh, of, of, of uh, statistics, and then you say, I want those statistics to match statistics of my texture sample. And by doing that, I'm going to project that noise image onto some point on that manifold. But it's not going to be the same point. It's going to be some other point on that manifold because the statistics are not capturing everything. They're, they're dropping some stuff. Right? And so that's kind of the, the big story of texture synthesis. And you know, the results look pretty good, at least for, for random textures. Maybe not so good for, for, for more structured textures. And then where, this is where Arrow uh, comes in and he said, okay, Eulish said first and second order statistics. You guys are only doing first order statistics. Let me add the second order, right? And then 
start, things became much better. The optimization also became much hairier. Um, and, and then Matthias was explaining earlier today, uh, the, their work with, with, with Leon Gattis was like, well, you know, let's take Arrow's model, but instead of doing these filters, let's just take um, features from a pre-trained convolutional network doing, you know, recognition task, and use those features as these uh, textons that Yulish talked about, and basically do the same kind of thing on these features, okay? And it, it worked you know, even better still. And now we get to GANs. The problem here, though, is that the features have been trained on something completely unrelated. The features have been trained on recognition task or ImageNet, which, as we know, throws a lot of stuff out. So maybe those no, are not really that great of a features to do this. And now if we look at what GAN is doing, it's kind of an interesting thing because the generator in a GAN, let's say that you're starting with a random noise image, so this is an unconditioned GAN, you're starting with a random noise image, and then you're, you're trying to produce a real, uh, a real image. The generator never gets to see any examples of real images, right? The only thing it gets to see is what discriminator thinks about his attempt. And the discriminator is the only one that actually gets to see real images. Okay? So, it kind of feels like a very similar story, right? It kind of feels like the discriminator is instructing the generator what is it that makes an image real. So it's kind of like sending its statistics about what will make it happy in terms of, of an image. Right? So I think it's kind of like this, where, where you have, this is, your, this is your generator, and this is kind of your discriminator. And, um, and so yeah, so my conjecture is it might very well be that somehow the GAN discriminator is learning the right kind of features to send to the generator so that the generator produces natural images. And I'm, I'm very e eager to, 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 have, uh, to have somebody, you know, think about this because, you know, we tried it for a little bit and we don't really, we kind of didn't, don't quite know um, how to attack this, uh, this insight or whether this insight is useful or not. But I think it's a, it's a very interesting uh, direction because it now kind of, kind of unifies all the, all the long line of work in texture synthesis with, with the GANs. So if, you're, if, you're, if, you're kind of, if you have some ideas about this, I would love to chat with you, okay? Okay, so now, meta supervision. Oh, oh all right. Um, so we talked about direct supervision being bad, GANs as being a type of meta supervision where we're supervising by a, a domain. Um, but there could be other meta supervisions as well. So another one that I like a lot is uh, cycle consistency. I don't know what f of x is. I don't know the label for it. But I, what I know is that g of f of x needs to get back to x. Okay? And so here I'll just show you uh, a very simple example of that we, where we want to translate horses into zebras, and we are basically using both uh, a, a, a cycle consistency and the GAN adversarial loss in there. And it's basically, you can think of it as a, let's say that you want to write a letter to your friend in France. You don't know French, but you have Google Translate, so you write a letter in English. Google Translate translates this into French, French, but you don't know if it did it well or not, because, you know, this Google Translate is not reliable. So what you can do is you can back translate it back to English and kind of see if it's making sense back in English. Okay? And if it doesn't, you maybe change something. So this is exactly the same uh, the idea applied to images. So you start with your image of a horse. You have a generator that generates a zebra. It has an adversarial loss that basically just says, just make it a zebra. I don't care which zebra. I don't have a, I don't have a label for you on what kind of zebra it should be. It just needs to be a zebra. So that by itself is not enough, so you get another constraint which says, and if you pipe it from, from another generator F, 
you should get back a horse, and that horse should be very similar to the horse you started with. And this is your, this is your cycle consistency loss here. And, and you can look at this, and again, if you squint, it looks like an autoencoder, right? But it's an autoencoder where the, the intermediate representation is not a bottleneck, but it's a different domain. So you can kind of push it through a different domain, and then you can kind of do it symmetrically on the other side as well, and then you get cute examples. Tra -la, and you can even do it on video, check out the tail, which is not quite right, but kind of fun. <laughs> and then you can, you know, kind of translate your fruits into each other. You can take my photos of Paris and make them Cezanne. You can go from paintings to photographs, um, different styles. Again, all the same, the, same, the same method. You can change seasons. You can go from CG to real and even creepier from real to CG. Um, and if you, if you don't have enough to buy an iPhone, but you have enough to buy a GPU, then you can <laughs> make a, basically train on uh, fan, uh, like, uh, high, high quality photos and, and, and low quality photos, and sometimes it basically gets you a, a depth of field effect for free. And even the failure cases are kind of fun. <laughs> I think this is enough uh, for today. Uh, I will, I will go to, let's see, to the summary. So, you know, the magic is, I believe, really in the data. I think we need to really be very careful about assigning too much intelligence to our, our, ourselves and our algorithms. I think we should have a healthy respect for the data. Um, machine learning methods love to cheat, but the reason they love to cheat is not because it's not their fault. It's because we give them a task that allows for cheating. And so it's uh, upon us to figure out a task that, that will make the, the algorithms do what we want them to do. Um, and it's worth thinking about tasks that, that discourage cheating, and I would argue that self-supervision is such a task, although the, the solid evidence for that is still lacking. Uh, we are doing our best to kind of push on it, but it's, it's definitely right now more of a, uh, uh, a, a belief rather than a, a solid argument, but, but, but I, I, I feel like that you know, we're, we're on a good way right now. Okay, well, thank you very much.